So yeah, uh, as mentioned, this is Dive into Zool, learn to run your own CI gatekeeper. Uh, my name is Clark Boylan. I am a Zool maintainer, so I help develop the software. I also uh, operate and run a Zool instance for the Open Dev service, along with several other people. Um, so I have experience both operating and developing the software. Uh, I think it's very useful, uh, and I hope that others will find it useful as well. Uh, and so the goal here is to show you that you can run your own Zool potentially on a laptop or in a VM uh, or even in a server in a data center uh, so that you can get started and, and understand how to use the tool. Uh, you could make changes to it, modify it to your needs, and, and so on. Uh, but before we get into how to run Zool, I think it's worth talking a little bit about what Zool is. Um, Zool is an open source CI CD gating system. Uh, the software is Apache 2 licensed, so yeah, just like other other pieces of software within the open infra kind of ecosystem, Apache 2 has been the preferred license. Um, there are some GPLv3 components like Ansible, so Zool uses Ansible to actually run the, the test jobs. Uh, so not everything is Apache v2. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what a gating system is in a little bit, because there's a, a bit to it and that kind of deserves its own attention. Zool is also scalable and highly available. Uh, Zool grew out of the OpenStack project and more than a decade now, we were running a bunch of Jenkins servers and trying to coordinate between them. And, and we learned that you know, we really wanted to have a system that could scale out and handle the number of jobs that we needed uh, to be running and also that we could avoid downtime with. Uh, and so Zool kind of has that built in. Uh, we do rolling upgrades, for example, with zero downtime and, and we think that, you know, that really, at this point, our users don't even notice that there's downtime and that's, that's great. Uh, and Zool is security conscious. If you've ever run a CI system before, you probably know that you eventually end up needing to deal with secrets in your CI system because you're going to push container images to some registry or you're going to push notifications to Slack or IRC or Matrix. Uh, maybe you're pushing commits into some system outside of your, your normal code review system or uh, I mean, anything else that you can think of. You trigger documentation builds or read the docs. All of these actions might need credentials, secrets, uh, and Zool understands that you're going to need to manage those. And so Zool has first class support for doing so kind of built right into the system. Um, you know, that said, why Zool? I think a lot of CI systems today kind of have some sense of, of support for all of this. Uh, Zool isn't entirely unique. Uh, and really, I think what sets Zool apart is that you can integrate and test everything before anything merges. And that's kind of what gating provides us. Um, in particular, Zool integrate with a number of different code review systems. So we support drivers for Garrett, GitHub, GitLab, and Pagor. Uh, we don't care where the code is. We will pull it in from any of these sources. You can configure multiple Garrett servers all at the same time, and we will you know, receive events from all of those different uh, services all at the same time. Uh, or you can mix and match. You can have Zool talking to Garrett, GitLab, and GitHub all at the same time. And again, we will integrate all of the events coming in and take action on them, um, regardless of, of where the, the code is, is actually being developed. Zool also integrates with a whole bunch of different compute resource providers. To run CI jobs, you, to run your tests, you need to, to have some place to execute them. And Zool will talk to all these different cloud providers like Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud, but also OpenStack, Kubernetes, OpenShift, uh, or even just static nodes that you've got in your data center or under your desk. Um, the idea being that we're, we're trying to make it easy for you to get up and going. You don't need to change how you're already building your software and deploying it. We'll just slot right into to what you're already doing today. Um, just like we can talk to different code review systems all at once, uh, we can do cross-project testing. So Zool has the idea of understanding that software is no longer built kind of as a, a lone entity that you need to test and, and develop. It's, instead, software is an amalgamation of parts. You've got your database servers might be you know, MySQL or MariaDB or Postgres. You, you're running on top of the Linux kernel. You're, you're dealing with third-party APIs to whatever system that you're integrating with for various servers, services on the, the internet, you know, chat GPT, or even just send an email. Um, 
what we want to enable is for you to run tests that don't care where the software lives and integrates it all together and, and tests it so that when you deploy it, we're going to make sure that the combination of all the parts, the integration, works and functions. Um, so for example, if you want to test a, a pull request like, to GitHub, integrating a change in Garrett, you know, you might do that. In our case, we, we have this example because we're integrating with Ansible, uh, but Zool is developed in a Garrett system. We can combine those two together and test it and make sure that it works when we go to, to production or you know, when we make a release. Um, and we can do that before anything merges. And you know that's really powerful because we're not needing to, to make a release just to test if this new feature works in the downstream project. We can ensure everything works before we're releasing it, and then release it with confidence that it's not going to break anyone. It's going to actually function. We don't need to go through and do a fix-up release. It just works the first time. And that's where gating comes in. Uh, gating is kind of leveled up pre-merge testing. We're testing our code before it, it merges. And to make that scale, you need to be able to, to run your tests in parallel. And to do that, we are going to build out speculative git states in Zool. So we pretend that the code is merged in a specific order. Uh, in this case, in Zool's case, we're going to use the order that people, human code reviewers, click the approve button. So you say, I, I approve this code. I want it to merge in this change. You do the next change, and so on. Zool will build out these speculative git states in that order. Uh, with the idea being we're going to test that future state, and if it passes that testing, we merge the code. And we do that automatically in that same order that you're approving things. And that allows us to start the test in parallel. Um, I think that, I'm trying to remember just kind of stats or who it was, but we we have for a long time controlled the, the amount of testing that can occur just because we don't want to consume all the resources that are available to the system if things are flaky or you know unhappy. Um, and we had one of our, our users ad, asked us to limit things because they were testing so much code in parallel that it was like consuming, like literally consuming all of the stuff in their data center. So when you get this going, it can be really, really powerful. Um, and one neat thing about this is git commits are a special type of artifact where basically when you push a commit into a Git repo, that's a, a way of publishing an artifact into a Git repository. Uh, you can so you can expand this system with gating and, and speculative states and pre-merge testing to general artifacts, uh, and we've done that with container images. So, for example, if you've got a container image over here in, in repo one and container image over here in repo two that depends on the first one to build, we can do that with speculative states test that those container images work alongside the code that modifies them. And then when the code merges and passes gating, we can also publish those same artifacts at the same time. We don't need to do another pass where we're rebuilding the artifacts because the code merged, retesting the artifacts because you know, you've updated the code. We need to rebuild the images. We need to retest. Now we can do all of that concurrently and treat those artifacts in the same way. So what does that get, get us? Like, you know. That's a lot of words for, for some interesting features, but why, why do we want that? Um, and I think the main thing is that we're enabling developers. We're enabling them where they are. We're, we're not going to force you to change your code review system. We're not going to force you to go use a new cloud provider to integrate with, to, to run the CI system. Um, we're enabling those developers to model complex systems. So the relationships between the code, the relationships between different artifacts, uh, the relationships between tests and production. We're enabling you to model all of that so that when you make big changes to the system, you're confident that those changes will work when they eventually end up in production. Um, and we're, we're handling conflicts up front. So for example, if, if you've got multiple teams in, in say a company, front end running on a GitHub Enterprise, back end running on a Garrett, maybe a DevOps system using GitLab, they're, they all need to work together to deploy code to production ultimately. And Zool can sit in between them and allow those, those different teams to specify the, the dependencies between their updates. You know, One team can be doing a, a complete refactor or rewrite. Another can be changing from one tool to another and, and, and so on. And rather than need to do those one after another in serial, 
the, the teams can simply specify, you know, we're building this on top of that, and by, or vice versa, and Zool will test it all in parallel and converge it in parallel as long as things work when they've done that. And so we've sped up the, the process within your, your business because the teams aren't needing to, to wait around for one another. And it's worth remembering, this is all open source. Um, a lot of people using Zool have kind of reached out and, and edited things, made things better for them, added features, fixed bugs. If Zool doesn't quite do exactly what you need it to do today, you can join us and, and help make it better for your needs as well. So hopefully I've, I've sold you on the idea that running a Zool is, is worthwhile, is, is something that you want to try. You know, where do you get started? There's a, a great little short URL that we've got that points you to some ideas on how to get started. Uh, it's at zoolci.org slash start. One of the pieces of information on that page is the quick start tutorial. It'll link you to that. Excuse me, let me grab some water here. And the, the quick start tutorial is, is a way to run a Zool locally, an entirely self-contained Zool system, on your laptop, in a VM, wherever. Uh, it does need to be a Linux machine, I believe. Um, so that you can have an experimental Zool that you can dive into. You can modify Zool. You can modify its configuration. You can update the jobs that are running in the system and, and understand how that quick start system works, which helps you understand how Zool itself works. Um, so to get started, You'll need to install a couple of dependencies, like Podman and Git. You'll need to clone Zool, uh, the Git repo for Zool. You'll then pop into an examples directory within the Zool repo, uh, and then run a, this Podman compose p Zool tutorial up. This brings up all of the containers that are defined in a Docker compose file within that uh, examples directory. Uh, and those containers together represent a, a running instance of Zool. And this takes a little bit of time, probably like at least at home it was a couple minutes, two, three minutes. Uh, depending on your internet connection, that may take longer or, or be shorter to get a really quick connection to download the, the container images. Um, and eventually things will coalesce into kind of a steady state and you'll see that the, the scheduler, executor, and, and web containers will, will register with the Zool component registry. Um, so this is where I'm hoping if all goes well, I can show you a running quick start tutorial on my laptop, and we can go through kind of how to configure it and, and what the services are that are running there. So let's see. So this is the log output of my current execution of that uh, tutorial. It, it looks a little bit different than that steady state from before, but we can see there are these component registry log lines where things are, are registering with the component registry. Um, if we pop over into another terminal, we can look at the various containers that are running. We've got a Garrett container. This is completely self-contained, so the code review system comes with the tutorial. Um, there's a Zookeeper database. Zool's, Zool's running memory is, is in Zookeeper, so this is a kind of a very important component of a, a Zool installation, is the Zookeeper database. There is a MariaDB SQL database. This is Zool's kind of long-term history of memory. Whenever you have an action in the Zool system, it makes a record of it in the MariaDB database, and then that way you can refer back to it later, like you know, when, how many times did this job run, how many times did it fail versus pass, so on and so forth. Um, there is the Zool scheduler. The Zool scheduler is Zool's brain. Uh, it's making all of the decisions on what action to take next based on the events happening in the world around it. So if someone pushes code to the code review system, or makes a comment on a change, or if someone is saying, no, do not merge this, the scheduler is ultimately making the decision on what to do with that next. There is a Zool web service. This is a dashboard that provides information to end users about the current status of the system, how to get logs, historical build records, and so on. There's an executor service. This is the service that ultimately runs Ansible for Zool. So the scheduler will say something like, I need this job to run. The executor will say, oh, I can do that for you. It will set up an environment and then execute uh, an Ansible process that works through the actual actions of the job. We've got a tutorial node. Uh, 
rather than integrate with any particular cloud provider in this setup, we just ship a container that acts like a VM that the test will SSH into and execute their code within. There's a node pool launcher. This is the service that manages the cloud resources. So if a job says, I need a node to run, the cloud launcher is responsible for booting that and then handing it over to the Zool job so that it can execute on it. And then clean it up later if necessary. And then we've got a log server. We need to be able to serve logs. And this it's just a simple Apache uh, server that will serve the logs for us. So these are the services that are running. If we look in this examples directory, we've also got a couple of configuration directories that store the Zool and Notepool configs. Um, if we look in the Zool conf, there's configuration to connect to Zookeeper. There's a key store password that's super secret. It's worth noting that the tutorial is maybe not the best production environment, so this is great for sandboxing and learning how Zool works. Do it on your laptop, but don't deploy this to production because the encryption secret is not very secure. Um, that's it, it won't prevent things from working, but if your database got compromised, people would be able to decrypt what was in, in the database. It points to a tenant configuration. Zool has the, the concept of tenants, which we'll dig into in a moment. Uh, connection information for things like, this is how I talk to our Garrett. How to, uh, connection for the database, this is how we're recording information into that MariaDB. Configuration for the, the web service, and so on. So this is kind of very basic Zool configuration for the, the processes themselves. There is also a tenant config. And Zool has the idea of tenants, which are a collection of Git repos that are all operating together within the Zool system to produce you know, outcomes, to, to merge code, to deploy to production. Whatever you're doing with Zool, you put related repositories together in a tenant. Um, and, and to do that, we have to define the tenants explicitly here in this configuration file. Uh, there's a config project. This is a Git repo called Zool config. This is where the running config for Zool will go. Things like, this is my job. This is where I've defined a base job. This is where I've defined some standard library stuff for our environment. Uh, and, and what makes the config project special is that it isn't executed speculatively, which means we can put kind of security related, or not related, but conscious things in there. Uh, and because it's not executed speculatively, we don't have to worry about them accidentally leaking which can happen if you were in a speculative system and, and allowed code to run before it was merged, or before it was reviewed, I mean. Um, and then we have normal untrusted projects uh, called test1 and test2. These are stand-ins for your normal Git repos. This is where your actual code would go that you want to test. Uh, because they're untrusted, we will run them speculatively, and basically that kind of limits what they can do configuration-wise. Uh, and then we've got this Zool jobs repo listed as another untrusted project. Uh, this is a standard library of jobs and job roles that Zool builds for the community. Uh, things like, this is how you run a Python job. This is how you build a JavaScript project. This is how you run a Kubernetes in a test environment that you want to run against. All of that is encoded in Zool jobs. We're going to use that here in a minute to kind of bootstrap the system and reduce the amount of work that we need to do. Then there is the notebook config. And like Zool, we need to tell it how to talk to Zookeeper, because that's where all of the running state is, is stored. Uh, we're then defining a static node called Ubuntu Jam. And all this is, is that's our container that we're running in the system as a static node. Uh, but you would, could also add providers in here to say, connect to Amazon or an OpenStack Cloud, Kubernetes, whatever. Uh, but because we're keeping it a simple, self-contained system with the, the minimal dependencies, we're just using a container here. But it's worth noting that these are here because if you want to make changes to the system, you might be editing these files and then restarting the containers to pick up those changes. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the basic configuration. We have a tenant. We have some connections to the databases and so on. But we don't have any jobs. We, we haven't told Zool what actions that we want it to be taking yet. So let's go ahead and do that. In order to speed this up, I've prepped a few changes in these Git repos. So I'm in the Zool config 
repository. I've already cloned it. Um, and in here, we're creating a base job. The base job is, is responsible for building out job actions that are required for your test environment. Uh, Zool's job configuration is hierarchical, so we'll have a base job, and then children will build off of that. And it's ideal to have the things that you need to happen consistently in your environment, like set up and tear down, happen in your base job. In this case, all we're saying here is that the default node set is that Ubuntu, Ubuntu Jammy node. Uh, so when we run jobs, they will run on that node that we have defined in Nodebool. We also need to define pipelines. The pipelines determine what actions we should take when certain events occur in the world. For example, we have this check pipeline. The check pipeline is going to trigger when these events occur in Garrett, or when a patch set is created, when a change is restored, or if someone adds a comment that has recheck in the string. That will trigger a check job. It will any unconfigured check jobs will run when these events occur. And if those jobs succeed, we vote back to Garrett with a plus one. If those jobs fail, we vote back with a minus one. We've also got a gate job, or gate pipeline. Similarly, this is going to trigger the jobs that are defined in the gate, and we do that when the code is approved. When we vote with a workflow plus one vote, we trigger the gate jobs. In this case, if things succeed, we plus two the change, and then we submit it. And submit is just Garrett's fancy way of saying merge the code. If things fail, we don't merge the code. Instead, we minus two and report that back. So again, we, we're merging things if they pass. If not, we, we report it back and do not merge. Then we've got some boilerplate that basically says, in the Zool conf config repo, we're going to run the no-op job for check and for gate. And no-op is a built-in in Zool that basically says, don't do anything, return success as quickly as possible. And we're doing that here just to, to bootstrap the system. Because again, we don't have any configuration that it's still sitting here in this Git repository. So let's push it to Garrett using the Git review tool, which has created a change in Garrett. Which no, it didn't. Oh, there it goes. Um, if we look really quickly at the files in here, they match what I just showed you. Now, Zool isn't reporting on this yet because Zool has no job configs. And because Zool has no job configs, we can't merge anything. So I'm logged in as the administrator in this Garrett. I'm going to go ahead and force merge this to just bootstrap the system. But once we've done that, we shouldn't need to be the admin anymore. So we're going to go ahead and submit that. That's merged. Great. So now we have a base job config, and we have two pipelines defined. Now we can go to our test repo, and we can actually run some jobs. So again, I've staged up some code. In this case, we're adding a job called test job. That job runs a playbook called testjob.yaml. And we're telling Zool we'll run that job in the check pipeline and in the gate pipeline. If we look in the playbook file, which is down here, we see that all this Playbook is doing is emitting a debug message that says hello world and then returning success. So if we go ahead and push this to Garrett, we will get, hopefully, Zool executing the job for us. Might take a second. There it goes. Zool has reported plus one. The build succeeded. And we can look down here at the logs, open that up. And then Zool says this build does not provide any results, uh, or any logs for that matter. And the issue there is our base job was too simple. The base job isn't doing enough setup or enough teardown to build up an environment that can collect logs for us and then report them back into Zool. So let's, we should fix that, and then we should get a working Zool job. So we're going to go back to the Zool config. Repo, we're going to check out the staged commit. And then we're going to look at this one. Um, so here what we're going to do is we're going to update that base job to be more robust and, and do more for us. We're, we're telling it, 
in the pre-run stage, this is for setup, we're going to run the pre.yaml playbook. Then in post-run, which is our cleanup teardown stage, we're going to run two playbooks, one that does cleanup and one that does log collection called postlogs.yaml. And then we're also going to tell it, hey, we're going to use some of those standard library roles found in Zuljobs so that we don't have to write a bunch of extra code ourselves. In the pre.yaml, we're going to set up a build SSH key so that we don't have to use the, the hard-coded one. We can transition over to an ephemeral key that's built just for the job. And then we're going to set up Git repositories within the test environment for us. And we do that using two standard library roles called add, add build SSH key and prepare workspace git. So we don't have to write that code if we're pulling it in from Zool jobs. It's all written for us. In the post logs playbook, we're going to generate a Zool manifest, again using a standard library role. And what that does is it generates a list of files, logs, artifacts, things like that, that we're going to report back to Zool. So the job is, is responsible for recording that information and feeding it back to Zool. And then we're actually going to upload the logs to our log server. And we're telling Zool, hey, you can find those logs that we uploaded in that manifest at this location, which is our container that is hosting the, the logs. And then finally, we've got a cleanup playbook here. And what that does is it removes the SSH key that we added previously. This isn't super important if you've got ephemeral nodes that are single use and being deleted anyway. But in our case, we're using a static container, so we want to clean up after ourselves so that we're not leaving that container in a dirty state. So we can push this to Garrett. And I'm going to stop running as administrator, log in as a normal user. And this time, instead of force merging the code, I'm just going to tell Zool that I approve this code. Please merge it for me if it pass, passes testing. So I've done that. The no-op jobs ran in check and succeeded. Now they should run in gate. And when that succeeds, we should merge the code. Oh, change is merged. Oh, good. I don't know why that's an error, but Garrett does report an error if you refresh too quickly. So this change has merged. We now have a base job that's configured to do more useful, interesting uh, interactions. So if we go back to the change earlier that had no logs, we can leave a comment that says recheck. And it should rerun the jobs for us. And this time, it will collect logs. It's going to take a minute just because now we're actually doing real work in this job. And it take just a little bit longer. I hope. There it goes. Build succeeded. We open the link. Instead of getting a message saying that we don't have any information, we actually have stuff here. We can look at the logs. We can open the logs. And then if I search for hello world, Shows up in the logs. Cool. So that's kind of the, the basic bring up of a, a, a Zool in the Quick Start tutorial. Hopefully, that kind of shows you what the services are, where the config lives in this system, how to edit the config to, to do more interesting things than just the no op job. Um, but you know, maybe you want to do more with this system. You know, what might you want to do? You could connect it to a GitHub that you have running in your system, or the public github.com installation. Um, that, that configuration would go in the Etsy Zool, uh, zool.com file. And then you can refer to Git repositories that live in GitHub within your tenant config. Uh, you know, this might be useful if you've already got code that you just want to run a build against or, or see how Zool would, would interact with GitHub. Uh, you could also potentially connect Zool, the Zool environment to your cloud provider that you've already got. Uh, maybe an OpenStack cloud provider. This would go in that Etsy notepool, notepool.yaml file. Uh, and it would look something like this, where you're defining a name, you're telling it the credentials are in a clouds.yaml file with this cloud defined. Only boot five servers at any one time uh, so that we don't consume all the resources uh, and use this image and so on. 
Or maybe you just want to run some real jobs. You can push code into that test one project, potentially a, a Golang project with maybe a, a JavaScript front end, and ask Zool to build your Golang code and run JavaScript testing uh, on that container that, you know, it won't be terribly fast, especially if it's running on a laptop like I've got here, but you could ask the, this tutorial environment to do that for you. And I would say if you do run this tutorial and, and you start you know, using Zool and, and find it useful, you should get involved. Uh, we're on Matrix in the poundzool colon open dev org room. Uh, there's also a mailing list which has more asynchronous conversation around kind of big changes that might be occurring that people need to be aware of. Uh, if you prefer to pay for support, uh, Acme Gating does provide paid support, and I believe there's a link to that in that zoolci.org slash start page, so you can get in touch with Jim at Acme Gating if, if that's more your speed. Uh, and then finally, the docs. Uh, we do have fairly extensive documentation on how to configure jobs, what feature flags are there to enable certain things that you might want to do. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of specific configuration items that are useful in different scenarios that you know maybe you find would be useful. The docs cover all of that. Uh, so if you're using Zool, definitely make sure you're familiar with the, the documentation. <coughs>